And Lucian.org podcast coming away, episode 560. This one I got Mobster here as he's going to interview me about fasting and longevity. It's going to be a Steve rant. We've had some requests from people for me to do a nutrition rant um, about this. I think it's a really important topic because nobody else covers this. Um and uh, it's really a shame in the in the uh, this type of, in this industry that we talk about. You know, we always talk about steroids. We always talk about stuff like that, but we don't talk about nutrition enough. And the reason is a lot of these guys out there don't really understand nutrition. And um, just because you're big, muscular, strong, veins popping out of your uh, arms and neck doesn't mean you know shit about nutrition. And most of these guys don't. Um, it's no different than someone who plays in the NFL. Do these guys really understand the game? Most of them do not. The ones that do end up having amazing careers, but do they really, really understand the game where they can retire and then coach and be successful? No. Wayne Gretzky, best NHL player ever in history, went and became a head coach in the NHL, and he sucked. Michael Jordan, best basketball player in NBA history. He became a general manager and sucked. He couldn't pick players. He sucked at trading for players. He sucked at, at, at finding talent. So just because some your friend is big and muscular and he tells you some nutritional advice does not mean they know what they're talking about. So this is going to be a really interesting thing. Now, a lot of people say, Steve, what are your qualifications? Where, well, I do have an advanced degree in nutrition, but – I've gone to school with people who have advanced degrees in nutrition who don't know shit either. You know, they just don't have the, the eye for it, you know? So just because you have a ton of education in it, just because you have a million followers and you're a nutritionist on Instagram, again, doesn't mean, you know, what I'm talking about, but if you listen to our podcast and you follow my advice, I can promise you that you will make amazing progress. And I've helped so many people over the years by thinking outside the box and actually just trusting the science on this stuff and trusting how our bodies work. So with that, I'll turn the podcast over to Mobster and give Mobster the chance to kind of uh, pick my brain on nutrition. Let's see what we got here. Let's see how, how many people we can help on this podcast, Mobster. I'm going to back you up on one thing uh, there, Steve. I did a training course to be a weight training instructor a million years ago, back in the ancient times before internet. And I came in, same as you, with a massive, massive interest in the sport. And the, everybody else on the course, except for me, was actually trying to be qualified, sponsored, and was already working in the industry. I'd come from the outside, and I absolutely fucking walked the test. Whereas the younger guys, the younger girls and guys, had zero application. It was a qualification to get. And so then the knowledge and how you work the knowledge and the application of knowledge and literally the thought process. So you and I, for example, especially with this podcast today, we're going to look at not just what things are supposed to be based on how they are now, but how they became this way and how, for example, nutrition has changed and our awareness of the history. People that do these courses have very little knowledge of the history. So let's start right at the top, guys. And it's El Numero Uno. I don't think Steve should stay too long on this because we have covered this in the past, but we'll start specifically with the benefits of fasting. So tell us why fasting is beneficial to people that are listening. Well, it's beneficial to every animal on earth because every organism on earth fasts from tiny cells in your body to the largest animals on earth, marine life, um, who are mammals, you know, fish, even they, they, they don't just eat all the time. Um, if you've ever been a fisherman, you go and you put the bait right in front of a fish and it just ignores it because, you know, fish don't always eat, you know, that's just an example, but like as human beings, it's in our DNA to fast. It's a survival mechanism to fast. If you're on an Island and you've got food right in front of you and you're going to be stuck in that Island for a couple months the body's mechanism is in place to eat all that food that you have access to, not just leave it because you eat a lot of it. Your body stores fat. And then once you run out of food and you've got to kind of just wait 30 days to be rescued off that island, you have enough time where your body has that stored food that your body can tap into that energy 
So it's not like we're we've evolved to just pick and in and, and graze on food. Now, certain animals out there are like that. Certain animals out there are their their guts have developed differently than ours and evolved differently, where they graze. And in certain marine life as well, they graze. If you've ever had an aquarium, some fish graze on seaweed. You would hook up seaweed on the side of the aquarium and the fish come and graze on it all day. Other fish, let's say a puffer fish, if you have a pet puffer fish, you're supposed to feed them once or twice a day. And that's it. They're not supposed to graze. So in nature, that's how it is. So we as human beings, we are... Feast or famine. And that's how we've survived and become such a dominant species because of our ability to feast or famine, uh, where we can go great periods without food and, and it will actually benefit us. Now, in modern society, the problem is we can eat what we want when we want. And it's gotten to the point where I can at 1 a.m. in the morning, be in the mood for lobster or steak or anything. And I can literally just go on my phone into an app and have it delivered to my house within 30 minutes. It's that ridiculous. And it's, you know, it that ability to just eat what you want when you want is the difference between now the physiques of Americans and, and people in other countries. So I look at look at India, for example. Look what's happened in India where people in India now, they have a growing middle class, but people near the cities in India are developing a lot of the diseases that we've developed in America over the past 50 years, such as cancers and heart disease and obesity. But the people in rural India who don't have as much access to food 24 seven and who have to do a lot of hard labor, they don't have those issues yet. But what's happening in the cities, Mobster, is people are basically able to eat what they want when they want. And, and and they eat restaurant food, they eat fast food. All the American chains have camped out there and they've made it cool to eat at McDonald's. They made it cool to eat at Taco Bell and you know, all these places, KFC and all this stuff because they, you know, they see the marketing for it and stuff. So those countries like China is a big one. China used to have virtually no uh, type two diabetes, virtually no obesity, uh, 50 years ago, and now they have as much as we do in America. Um, and it's getting really crazy because of the growth of the middle class and the growth of people having money and being able to eat what they want when they want. Uh, and that's that's what's killing us. And you don't have to work for it. In America, 100 years ago, 99% of people had to work for their food. They had to walk to town to get food. They had to farm to get food. Now, how many people have to really do that? Not very many. And, and I can give you one final example on that. Look at the Native, the native Americans. Uh, there was a tribe in New Mexico, in northern New Mexico. And I read, a, I read a paper on this a couple of years back. And they went from having no obesity, no cancer, no type 2 diabetes, none. Once they got introduced to the modern diet now today that same tribe that same tribe their obesity their type 2 diabetes their cancer rates have gone from zero to over 50 percent so that just tells you it's not that we've it's not your genetics it's your lifestyle it's the food that you're eating it's the, the food that we're putting in our body is literally killing us and that's been the big change so you can't blame, oh, it's my genetics, it's my genetics. That's just a cop-out. And if I'm going to rant about something, it's going to be that because I'm sick of people saying, well, diabetes runs into my family, cancer runs in my family, heart disease runs in my family. What that is, is your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, they also have bad habits. They have bad lifestyle choices. So that runs in your family. But to basically say that, yeah, you know, cancer runs in my family – you may have a genetic disposition for a certain cancer. That is true. You could be carrying a certain trait, certain genetic. But even if you are, that's all the more reason to not eat poorly and not have a poor lifestyle. So food is literally killing us in the process.
So that's the number one thing. That's the number one reason, Mob Serve, that fasting is so important. Because fasting allows you to make up that issue. So you're eating all the time. Fasting is the way for you to, to offset that. Yeah. So like I'll give you one more example. In blue, the blue zone, uh, there's one blue zone location called Acaria, Greece. Okay. It's an island off the coast of Greece. These are the people that live over 100 years. These are people who are extremely healthy. Six months out of the year, because they are they have a religious, in their religion, they believe in this, is you fast six months out of the year. So they'll fast for a month, eat a month, or fast for a week, eat a week. So over the course of the year, they end up fasting a total of six months out of the year. It's not six months straight, but that's a perfect example of how you should be treating nutrition. So really... I mean, you should be eating a time-restricted window every day uh, between a one-hour and six-hour time-restricted window. That's how our guts have developed to eat, not every two hours. Yeah. So I don't care if you are professional in body at the high le highest level. Last three year, Mr. Olympia champions, Hottie and Big Rami, they both fast one month out of the year for their religion, for religious reasons. But they also do it because it actually jump. benefits them and makes them better bodybuilders. Let me jump in for a second here, Steve. I've actually covered this previously in a podcast. I said, look, biologically and specifically nutritionally, we as humans that you would recognize as humans have been around for about a million years. There's an argument to be said that from the shaven ape standing up and walking around, that's about two million years. But as recognizable human beings, we've been around for about a million years. And for about 2% of that time, roughly 20,000 years, maybe a little bit longer, we've cultivated crops. That means for the other 98% of the time that humanity has been recognizable as humans walking on this planet, we didn't cultivate. That means we hunted and we foraged. And forage, for those of you that don't know, it basically means we're looking at plants that we can eat, plucking berries that we can eat, eating fruit off the ground. Otherwise, we hunted, right? So that meant, as Steve said, when he says feast or famine, there's basically that our bodies, as has existed as human beings, have had to run and catch and kill the food, the animal food, and run and hunt and look and forage for and find edible food that we could eat. So it means that there's been times when our bodies have quite biologically, still biologically set up to go without food for long periods of time, days, in order to then find something to eat. And the other thing, we would do the feast or famine. So we would eat as much as we possibly could, lay down and sleep that off, or carry it back to the kids and the mum or whatever, and the rest of the tribe and so on and so forth. And we didn't eat as much as we possibly could because we had no ways of preserving the food. But no, what we're also talking about here is literally just the food. Once we got into cultivating food, we started to grow crops that would last longer. So that's where we had wheat and flour, and sugar, and salt, and all those other wonderful things. And unfortunately, it's just got worse and worse and worse. But I'm also thinking, Steve, when you talked about the blue zone there, there's actually an argument to be made. I think I'll get Steve to, to comment on this as well. You live longer. If you look at the longest living people on the planet, and it doesn't even matter where they come from, and I'm including the blue zones, but France, Germany, England, whatever, those people, and it's typically women, but occasionally it's men, are small and they aren't big eaters. They're, no one is 40 stone and 100 years old. They're tiny, they're six, they're seven, they're eight stone. Little withered up old women and they're eating once, maybe twice a day. So without even meaning to, they aren't eating a lot. They're not eating frequently. And it's actually amongst other factors, part of the reason why they stay alive. The blue zone factors are specific foods that they're eating there. But for example, Steve, there's an argument to be made for growth hormone, actual medical benefits that can not just take us back to primitive time, but actual medical benefits that have come from fasting in the science and has been proven to be effective. And like us, I'm thinking, for example, I believe growth hormone, natural growth hormone production and other things. Talk on that quickly, Steve, and then we'll talk about your own fasting experiences. Well, here's the thing, and this is a great point you make on the HGH. When you fast, your HGH goes up. Why? Again, evolutionary built in our system. Same thing with other animals. Because what happens is the motivation to feel hungry. And this is another rant. I'm going to, I hear people who are like fat 
who are like, I, I'll be hanging out with them and they're like, I'm hungry. I want food. I'm like, why do you need food? Like literally we haven't done a goddamn thing today except sit around, watch TV. And we went for a little walk. We walked your dog around the block and you're fucking hungry. You've got all that energy on your body. And then they get upset with me, but I'm not trying to be an asshole. But my point is you have all that energy on your body. How are you hungry? It's not hunger. It's your body signaling, go find food. And it's also a food addiction because your body is addicted to eating. You become, it's become a habitual thing. When I did a 19 day fast during that fast, I noticed myself walking up to my fridge and opening my fridge. I actually emptied out my fridge. Okay. During that fast, which is going to be hard to do for a lot of you out there who obviously live with people. But for me, I emptied out my fridge. I was living alone, but I was habitually opening up my fridge. It was a habit. Just And I'd open my fridge, there'd be nothing in there. I'd be like, oh, shit, I, yeah, I'm fasting. I'm not supposed to eat anything. But because I was so used to opening my fridge, so a lot of you do that. Maybe you see something on TV that upsets you. Maybe you're on the computer, on social media, and something upsets you. And then the first thing you'll do is go get food to make you happy. Oh, I'm happy now. When you were a kid growing up and you were crying and making a scene in public, because your parents shove ice cream into your face just to shut you up? A lot of you did. I know, I, I think when I was growing up, that's what my parents did to me too. So you've learned to use food as a reward center. We've also trained our dogs and our cats to do the same thing. Our cats sometimes want attention from us. They don't want food, but what do we do to shut our cats up or our cu shut our dog up? We give them a treat. I don't want, you know, they're like, wanna, they wanna play with us. They want attention. They wanna get belly rubs. They wanna get their ears scratched but we'll just shove food in their face just to shut them up. And then they'll eat their food and then they'll go take a nap and leave us alone. Well, it's the same thing that we went through growing up. So food has been become a habitual thing where parents just want to cut the, shut the kids up and just not deal with the kids. And that's the big mistake. And uh, that's hard to shake off as an adult because every time we go through something as an adult, now the first thing we want to do is go to the freezer and grab ice cream this way, we get happy. The ice cream makes us happy. The cookies make us happy. The cake on our birthday makes us happy. You see what I'm saying? So you have to stop treating food happy. Now, to go back to your question, Mopsa, before I let you chime in, HGH goes up when you're fasting. Not when you eat. When you eat, it crashes back down. So those people in the blue zones, they have high HGH in later years of their life because they fast so much. So, and the reason for that is insulin goes one way, growth hormone goes the other. So if you spike your insulin, your growth hormone goes down. If your insulin levels come down, your glucagon and your HGH go up. So during a fast for five straight days, when you're fasting, your HGH goes straight up. So these pro bodybuilders who are fasting, who are getting ahead of everyone else, they have something that other people don't. They have that little weapon. And you cannot make it up by actually taking exogenous growth hormone. It's just not the same. It's just like naturally high testosterone levels versus exogenous testosterone levels. It's just not the same because it's synthetic. Synthetic HGH, synthetic testosterone is not better than real HGH in the body and real testosterone in the body. It's just not. Ask anybody who's been on TRT and they'll tell you the same thing. They'll tell you, I felt better before TRT when my testosterone level. Now, if your testosterone levels are in the gutter, then yeah, you're going to feel better on exogenous testosterone. But if your testosterone levels were good before, let's say your testosterone level were at 700 before, then you go on TRT and your testosterone levels, you match that 700. It's just not the same. It just isn't. So you want to basically keep your HGH level strong in your body naturally, and fasting is the way to do it. Your HGH starts going up literally after 10 hours on a fast, and then it progressively rises and rises and rises for five straight days straight up. And that's yeah. going to help you with anti-aging and all the benefits of HGH over the long term. So you'll actually get more lean muscle mass, lean muscle tissue over time. You'll lose more body fat over time. And you'll also benefit from all the anti-aging properties of HGH in the body when you're fasting. So that is why people in the blue zones, one of the reasons fasting is so beneficial is because of the HGH effect. There's one more thing, Steve, and I don't like this particular turn of phrase because 
people, I mean, if some people take it to mean that they can get away with doing stupid stuff and then they can go in fast and it's all, all okay. And it's the idea that you reset your gut. But one of the things that Steve's touched upon is that because we're constantly feeding, our stomachs are constantly working, including many hours into the night while you're asleep. And so one of the issues, I think, is it the macriome, Steve, or the biome, where essentially your gut health and specifically your gut flora it becomes depleted. Now, that's natural as part of your age, but it's also to do with the processed food, which we're going to touch on momentarily. So there's an argument to be made with fasting about giving your gut a chance to reset. And again, I don't like that phrase because it means some of it means to so some people, the listeners are hopefully uh, better educated, but it means some people could go out and get drunk, eat loads of hot dogs, crazy junk food, and think if I have a few days without eating, I'll be fine, my stomach will settle down. That's not what's happening. But it is a way, especially if you're nutritionally aware, as I hope our listeners are, that you have some additional benefit. And I mean, another one, for example, I think you've touched upon also, Steve, um, is this idea you kind of get a clear mind. There's an idea that you stress and feel crazy hungry, and that's kind of true the first 24 or 36 hours. But then after that, you actually feel more energetic. You have a clearer head. And as I said, you're also resetting the gut. So there's th those, are, those are bonuses as well. Let's touch upon something else now, though. Let's talk about, and I think it's it, obesity in modern times, but specifically why waistlines of people have changed since the 70s. I'll say something now, and then I'll let Steve jump in. There's a photograph I've seen doing the rounds on, on Facebook and on social media, and it's a picture of people going to the beach in the 70s and people going to the beach now. And people now are fatter. You're in the photograph, which is done around for some years, Steve. It's black and white. Might be colour, but I think it's black and white. And you have to look hard to find one person that looks out of shape. Now, obviously, manual labourer has been changed by machines and so on and so forth, but a lot of it is diet. So what about that then? Why, yeah. why have people literally got a bigger waist? So in America, the first time a president ever had any type of health problems that was hard had to do with heart disease was Dwight Eisenhower, and that was during the 50s. And it was a big shocker. And people are like, oh, my God, the president has heart disease. What's going on here? Now, remember, FDR died in office, but he was really, really old. He was in a wheelchair. He had other medical issues, but he didn't have the heart disease issues, even though he was in the wheelchair. So it was a big shocker in the 50s and then especially in the 60s. People started developing heart disease more normally. But even then, in the 60s, 70s, if you watch sitcoms, if you see old photos, like you some officer, people just didn't have the waist. Now, Eisenhower, one of the things Eisenhower did was he was a big on sugar. You know, he had a lot of sugar. So he ate a lot of food compared to other people. He had access to food. He was, he was, you know, he had that. And most people didn't. So if we go back even further, back in the 1800s, for example, the only people who had heart disease and cancers and stuff like that were the wealthy. And if I went back even further, mobster, to your era in the Middle Ages in Europe, the kings and the queens and the princes and, and all those stuff, the, the nobles, they were the ones who were fat. They were the ones who sat around. They had food brung to them, you know? Roman times, same thing. The emperors, they were the ones who were fat because they could eat what they wanted when they wanted. They just asked, hey, you know, bring me food, and they'll bring them food. So that's the difference. Today, everybody, you could be working class, middle class, upper class, whatever, you have access to as much food as you want today, and we're swimming in food. Um, if you're poor, you just go get to the uh, go get a burger at the fast food joint. Um, and like McDonald's, growing up, it cost ninety nine cents for one of those cheap burgers from McDonald's. We used to go there and get that all the time. I grew up poor. We used to go there. My dad used to take us and get burgers, you know, all the time. So I mean, it's really changed in that way. The processed foods, the fake foods. So. That's been the killer, my officer. Being able to eat what you want when you want has been the real killer. And then the fake food. So I'll recommend something. I don't really like to recommend third-party things, but there's an app called YUKA, and I make nothing from recommending them. And it's a really good app. I, you know, If you download that app on your iPhone or whatever, and then go around your pantry, go around your refrigerator and scan the barcodes, it will tell you you'll have a 0 to 100 rating on the foods and the drinks that you're putting in your body. And if you went around and did that, I guarantee you, you'd find most of the stuff in your house right now in packages 
are bad, are bad for you. They have too much sugar. They have too much this. I don't care what the label says. The label could say zero fat, zero sugar, whatever. That's they, 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 these companies do a good job of using loopholes and hiding what they're giving you. So you basically, you don't know what you're putting in your body. I'll, I'll simplify it like that today. Yeah. Unless you're eating something that's not in a package. Like if you eat a banana, you know you're getting a banana. If you eat an apple, you know you're eating an apple, right? You, you eat broccoli, you know you're getting broccoli, right? Um, but these things in the packages are absolutely killing us. And it's good. you're going to find that they are really bad for you. They have a lot of additives in there, which make you very, very sick. Make your body sick. Make your gut sick. Increase the chance of cancer. Increase the chance of other diseases. It's like a magnet to disease. Sugar cane. Okay, if you've ever had real sugar cane, like I have, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a farm and they had some sugar cane. I took the sugar cane, I snapped it in half and I tasted it. The liquid of that sugar cane tasted very sweet. That's natural. That's the plant. That's got fiber in it. That's got all that good stuff. But what do they do to make sugar? What do they do to make sugar cane? They take that sugar cane and they take it. What do they do to make cane sugar and refined sugar? They take it to a factory. They process it, they bleach it, and they make it into table sugar. Then they take that sugar and they put it in your food. Or in a lab, they develop these artificial sweeteners in a lab, and then they put it in your food. These additives that are dangerous, that have been linked to mental issues, that have been then linked to other types of diseases out there. And they put that in our food. So you don't know what you're putting in your body when you eat some out of a package. Okay, so the food industry is so powerful that it's very difficult to get a straight answer on stuff. But like I said, that app I told you, YUKA is a really good tool to have because you can actually scan things. And you'll figure out pretty quickly, Mobster, that things in packages, things in boxes are not good for you. And you should avoid them. So most of your diet should be natural whole foods. They should be actual singer ingredient whole foods, not things in packages that have 30 different ingredients. And that are kept full of chemicals and additives and artificials and all that crap. So that right there is a great way to immediately transform your health and transform your diet. You can literally go today and check out your fridge, check out your pantry and eliminate those quote unquote fake foods and processed foods. And that will really make a big difference. You will feel the difference within a couple of weeks just by changing your diet and getting away from that stuff. But I see all the time, this is what pisses me off, Mobster, is um, I have, there's people, they're like, I, I, you know, they'll ask me, oh, Steve, is this good for me? They'll show me like a drink, right? One of those smoothie drinks or whatever. And, I, and I'll look at the ingredients, I'll go through the ingredients. I'm like, oh my God, this is so bad. It's got so yeah. much crap in it. But then they'll point to the front label and it says, whoa, well, it says, it says low fat. And I'll be like, oh my God, like how fucking dumb can you be, you know? And I try to stay patient with people, but look, they're trying to sell you that bottle, uh, that smoothie. They're trying to sell it to you. So of course they're going to put that on the label to try to trick you to thinking it's good for you. But when it says low fat or no fat, that's a signal that they have additives, they have added sugars, they have added crap to it. Yeah. So it's not good for you at all. So you Let want me give you to two examples. Yeah. Two examples. And we move on to the next one. So, I've, I've talked about this on previous shows, uh, glucose syrup. And uh, I, I did a voluntary youth worker thing where uh, the social worker for kids, for children in the borough came round and talked about how the poorer children, the, uh, the, the that part of society where mum and dad were ever on minimum wage, were coming home and cooking up ready meals. And the problem with the ready meals is it was glucose syrup was nearly always a standardised ingredient. It makes poor food, low-quality food, low-grade meat tastes nice. Unfortunately, it was leading to dental issues for those children, whereas the middle class and the higher earner children's parents were cooking more likely to cook food from scratch or just buy a better quality food. So, guys, even without the app, you need to look at the ingredients. I'll give you one example, Steve. I make homemade ice cream, and one of the better companies, we've got very good companies here in Wales, one of the better companies makes a sorbet, and a sorbet is essentially flavoring and ice. But the, in order for this product to travel and be stored in, in shops and sold weeks, if not months down the line, the ingredient profile for their sorbet has 17 
fucking ingredients. It should have two, three at the most. If I make a vanilla ice cream, so if it's five ingredients, if I buy even a high premium vanilla ice cream from the supermarket, it's eight, nine, or ten ingredients. So you need to learn to read. The best thing to do, which Steve and I have touched upon, is organic, locally produced organic, with the least amount of ingredients. Talk about, and I know that we've covered this subject previously, why restaurant food and fast food is even worse uh, than, than we think it is. Yeah, because fast food, here's the thing. Well, this is what fast food and restaurants do. They're in, they, they have really, really tight margins, okay? You have an inventory that goes bad, and that's the food. And you have employees to pay, you have overhead, you have to pay your utilities, you have to pay your rent. So obviously, you can't let your food spoil. So what do they do? Even Whole Foods, you go to Whole Foods, the hot food bar there, people think, oh, the hot food bar at Whole Foods must be good for you. It's not, because they add refined oils to the food. The refined oils do several things. They taste good. They make you satiated. Number two, they help preserve the food so it doesn't go bad because does Whole Foods want to put the hot food bar and put the food out there and have it go bad after a couple hours? Then they lose money and people and their, and their customers get sick, get food poisoning. They don't want that, right? So restaurants are the same way. They don't want their customers to get food poisonings. They don't want their customers to you know, for the food to go bad and they're serving rotten food, food. So they use refined oils to cook their food. And number three, it's cheap. Refined oils are cheap. It keeps them in business. If they were to use unrefined, unprocessed coconut oil, it would cost a fortune. You get a tub of that, it's like 20, 25 bucks. So really you got to be careful with refined oils. That's another thing I want you guys to do is go in your kitchen and check out what oils are using the cooking. These spray on oils need to go in the trash. These vegetable oils need to go in the trash. There's no such thing as a vegetable oil. You can't make oil out of a vegetable. That's a scam. All these uh, canola oil, it's a killer. It's all refined. The olive oil even. Your olive oil is even a scam because olive oil in the United States is a loophole. Only 50% has to be actual olive oil. And even in that case, it's, it's refined anyway. So I don't trust any of those oils. The only oil I trust is unrefined, unprocessed, cold-pressed coconut oil. So you need to switch to that. But if you eat at a restaurant, they're not going to be using that because they can't make a profit. So unfortunately, you need to avoid restaurant food and fast food for that reason. It's all fake. It's all processed. It's all junk. So if you can do what I tell you to do, download that app I told you, go around your house, eliminate the bad foods out of your house, and then stop eating out, then you will rapidly make a change in your health right away. And again, people who say, well, you know, our ancestors used to eat anything, blah, blah, blah. Our ancestors didn't have refined oils everywhere. It's basically junk. Chick-fil-A, here's another place. This is criminal what they do at, at this place. Peanut, refined peanut oil is what they used to cook their food. Absolute poison. Absolute poison. It's just like it's like drinking, it's like drinking gasoline. That's how harmful this stuff is. And it's rapidly causing the deterioration of our health obesity and all these health problems that you're having inflammation now you say steve steve you know why can't i go i, I went and did a workout i burned all these cars why can't i go enjoy chick-fil-a why can't i go enjoy taco bell mcdonald's burger king whatever because these refined oils are inflammatory in the body so they're what they're going to do is they're going to make you it's going to hurt your recovery it's going to increase the chance of you getting injuries and it's going to increase inflammation in your body. So it's going to, your joints aren't going to feel good. Um, and across the board, your organs are going to be more inflamed. And that's going to cause more problems. It's going to cause your heart, blood pressure to go up. It's going to cause your kidneys to be more strained. It's going to cause your liver to be more strained. And it's already strained because you're using anabolic steroids. So absolute disaster. You have to know what's, what's going in your body. That's the prime rant that i'm making you have to know what you're putting in your body at all times you have to and don't give me this shit of a cheat meal once a week our ancestors you know what their cheat cheat meal was raw honey that they would find okay if they weren't if you were if they were lucky enough not to get stung to death by bumblebees they were lucky to have raw honey or raw maple syrup or something like that that should be your treat Something natural like that. That's a treat that you can enjoy if you want something sweet. Not cookies, cakes, ice cream, all this other shit. Like we're children trying to feel better. So remember, 
And remember, a lot of people too, they they can't even go like three, four hours without food. They're like, oh, I'm going hypoglycemia. If you're unless you're on diabetes medication, which is causing your blood sugar to drop, the fact that you think you're going hypo doesn't make any sense because that's not how our bodies work. Like when I did a 19 day fast, my blood sugar dropped. Okay. And then it stopped dropping. It got into the fifties or sixties and it just stopped dropping. It doesn't just keep dropping all the way to zero. So what is going on there? It's not that you're going hypo. It's that you're basically just a crack addict when it comes to sugar and carbs. That's all yeah. it is. And you're like, I gotta have it. I gotta have it. Do you really think our ancestors, like they'd go and they hunted for food and then they would just like eat a bunch of carbs and a bunch of sugar after they they did that? No, they had to get their thing back to the shelter. They had to prep the food. It would take hours before they even ate anything, hours. So this idea that, oh my God, I need protein after my workout or I'm gonna lose my muscle. That's not how our bodies work. If you caught a big animal, You'd have to get your group to come help you carry it back to the shelter. You'd have to yep. skin it. You'd have to clean it. You have to gut it. You have to prepare the fire to cook it, right? That takes time, all right? Have you ever cleaned the fish before? It takes time to clean a fish. I come home from fishing. I've got 10 fish to clean. I got my knife. I got my cutting board. It takes me an hour to clean the fish and fillet them and cut them and everything. I don't just come home and, and eat the fish like that. So you have to realize that you don't have to, after your workout, run off and get protein or else your muscles are going to disappear. That's just the myth that the, the supplement companies and the protein powder companies want to tell you. So that's another thing that I ran about that I think is really stupid. People are like, oh, you got to eat within 30 minutes after your workout. No, no, no. you don't. Nope, no, not at all. There's zero scientific evidence that that's true. I don't care if you're a bodybuilder at the highest level. I don't care if you're just a gym rat who goes and works out once or twice a week. You do not yeah. have to get food yeah. and throw food at your body right after work. I, I fact, it's that better if you too. wait. It's better if you wait, monster, because you wait till your adrenaline goes down and and then you sit down. Once your adrenaline is down, then you eat because now your body's not under double stress. So if your adrenaline is still high after a workout or a run or something, let it calm down. Let your body relax. Let your body calm down. Let the hormones balance out then eat your meal because there then your body's not under stress but if you eat if you throw a protein powder right at your body five minutes after workout it's actually going to hinder your recovery it's not going to help your recovery so mobster final thoughts on that and we definitely uh, go to disclaimer but if you guys have any other questions on this shit come to the forums ask me i'm there to help everybody i'm trying to get everybody healthy who listens to this podcast uh, that there's so many things that we could cover that we haven't even covered today steve i mean uh, I know, for example, the foods that we eat now that we never ate before because in the past we used to throw them away. And that literally, they were waste products. There are foods that we have now, margarine instead of butter. There's an argument to be made that we should be eating more fats and less carbs because there was a massive issue with cholesterol. And, but the, the science was screwed. So there's so many things there. Uh, um, I've, I've referred it on podcasts before to so Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, Randy Roach's Muscle Smoke and Mirrors. And at least book one talks just about the nutrition with fake food. We're talking about fasting, regardless of your goals, and food addictions and a bunch of other stuff. And literally how some foods are set up, as Steve said, to tweak you in a way that makes you eat them almost like a drug. Uh, and, 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 and also why, for example, there are more people that eat that way than there was before, and yet the population hasn't changed. So there's a bunch of subjects that we can cover. So hopefully we'll do a part two at some point in the future on this one. As always, please note, we are not doctors and the opinions are ours. It's our view and is based on our experience and views on the topic. Our podcast are for informational purposes and entertainment only. The freedom of speech and the First Amendment applies.